Welcome to another episode of the Mindset Athlete Podcast with me, James Roberts, transformational coach, two-time Paralympian, and TEDx speaker. I have another awesome episode for you today, so let's get straight into it. And on today's show, I've got Tyler Saunders. Tyler was born with one leg, found wheelchair basketball in 2007, took the path by bettering himself with health and fitness and taking it seriously in 2012, qualified as a PT in 2015, and now helps people achieve a better quality of life despite their excuses. So welcome on to the show, Tyler. Thanks for having me, mate. I appreciate the the guests appearance yeah looking right. forward to having a chat with you, man. we finally got it done didn't we because uh, yeah, yeah it's been a long time coming but we finally got the schedules aligned and i'm finally booked in a slot so <laughs> could, well I, I, the, I, I can't i can't fault you for for having to cancel last time because you 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 were saying that your wife couldn't control the kids so i think people can relate to to that during during obviously the first lockdown yeah it was um I can't remember the scenario, but I think when we penned it in, it was just like everything was kind of reaching its peak. And there were times where, you know, you've got everything under control and everything's cool. And then the next day it's just like, ah, this is all too much. And I think it's one of those days where, you know, the kids were just being like, they just weren't sitting still. They're just driving everyone up the wall. And the exact time we'd, we'd specified, yeah, I figured it was just all on top. So I'm like, sorry, mate, got to reschedule. And then a little bit down the line, we got it back in. And yeah, things are a little bit more normal now with them going back to school and whatnot. So yeah, I think there's a lot of people out there who have kids who are, you know, your followers watching, they'll get they'll get <laughs> where I was coming from with that. So but yeah, here we are now. So let's get it going. So talk about... Obviously, you you play on the marketing very well, in my opinion. And I put my I haven't got my hat on, but I tap my tap, <laughs> tap my cap to you in terms of utilizing, you know, the disability instead of it using it as an empowerment tool. You use it to kind of say to people, "I've always talked a good game of saying what's your excuse," but you pretty much gone out there and said it. Oh, um, right. Um. Yeah, and this, you know, some days, like, I don't always have that, you know, mantra of what's your excuse. Some days I'll, you know, not really feel up to doing anything or, like, working hard or training or eating healthily, but it's not really a motivation thing. Like, that's one thing I've been trying to push a lot more is this motivation is going to come and go, and you kind of have to just do things even when you don't feel like doing them. And the kind of no excuses thing kind of came around just from when I started training in the gym and looking after myself and living a more healthier lifestyle and, you know, being more active. The case that, you know, this guy who clearly has a physical impairment can still take the time to, you know, look after his health and his fitness. So if he can do it, like, what excuse do I have? And that wasn't something I kind of, I came up with or entered the industry with. It was just people kind of like, well, if you're doing it, what excuse do I have? And yeah, it kind of just kind of just stuck. But obviously, I've known you for a, a, n- a number of years. I think it's well, it's probably closed on probably near near a decade now. And what I found surprising was you went to always healthy, and and be it from you playing, and we didn't even mention it in the introduction. You played professionally overseas for a mm. number of years out oh, in Germany. What was the kind of turning point for you to kind of say enough's enough? I can't go out on uh, these male holidays and, and getting pissed and, and eating whatever I want. What was kind of the trigger point for you to kind of say that's that that needs to change and I need to go in a different direction? Well, it purely was my first year abroad um, when I went to Germany to play semi-professionally out there. And just from, you know, stepping up the, especially the kind of mindset and and dedication side of things where we trained, you know, a couple of hours a day, four times a week. We had a, you know, a high level game every weekend. And I was surrounded by, you know, national team players from all the top countries, Canadians, Australians, USA. Um, 
Dutch, like they were just like high level players around me. So within that first year of generally upping my activity level, I saw my my body, my physique change for the better. I changed my mindset essentially. I started to get a little bit more kind of focused and determined and resilient. And when I done that stint and came back to the UK, prior to the whole kind of overseas trip, I was working as an administrator in an office. So after uni, graduated, didn't have a real plan for or direction with what I was doing. I kind of just went into a job just to, you know, pay bills, pay my rent, keep going. And it was office based. It was, you know, nine to five. Diet was horrendous. It still carried on from university style diet. So, you know, I wasn't cooking anything nutritious or fueling my body properly. You know, everything was beige, you know, takeaways, all of that kind of stuff. And when I was working in the office, I was, you know, still part of the GB setup doing part time, but still wasn't really taking, you know, my nutrition or training seriously. And it's only when I got to Germany and, and like fully immersed myself in that lifestyle and saw the benefits when I came back from my stint, my three years out there, I was like, I can't do this office stuff again. Like I can't regress, not regress, but I can't go back to that type of lifestyle with like, you know, most of the day will be spent inactive. And I had better nutrition habits then, but I just thought, no, nah, like I'm, I'm in the fitness realm now. So it just so happened that the, the PT qualification came up on, you know, targeted advertising as we kind of spoke about before and yeah that was it that was um, just from that point 2015 done the course qualified and that's pretty much been it so I, I did come into the game really late and that's something where I say to people it's never too late to make improvements to your lifestyle to you know become healthier to eat better to you know try and get more quality sleep to drink more water like all these fundamental pillars of fitness and health I wasn't doing them when I was you know, 12, I didn't grow up playing team sports. I wasn't a, you know, disciplined, focused, thoroughbred of an athlete. This all kind of came quite late on, but I've still managed to improve my life. I've, you know, kind of made my situation better through fitness. And I've only been in the game since like, I don't know, 20, 2012, 2013, like taking it seriously. And if I hadn't, life could have been a whole lot different. And you talk of words like resiliency, focus, and I can't remember the other one that you said, but I'm surprised that you say you didn't have resiliency would have, you know, being born with a disability. Or would you class it as, as something slightly different in terms of the terminology? It was slightly different. I mean, being born with the one leg, it almost just became like a fact of life. Like it, it is what it was, what it was, but with, with having the one leg it kind of brought about feelings of you know self-doubt and kind of not inadequacy but always being self-aware like I always knew I was limited in various aspects of life and I never really kind of knew my capabilities until I got into the fitness industry and started to train and kind of push my body in that sense so definitely my mindset and resilience has improved or increased since training but yeah it's not something I was kind of always born with like I haven't always had this kind of you know laser focus and even like now I'm still working at it I'm not a, a finished product by any means I'm not the kind of finished article or, you know complete as it were like every day is still a journey every day is some development personally in some way or form but you know it, it it has been a, a positive journey so far and hopefully it will continue. And do you think, Tyler, that and we were talking about Instagram before beforehand, you know, it's like a double-edged sword in terms of we talked about it from a marketing perspective, but for somebody that's starting out on their journey, is it I'm not gonna be negative to it completely, but can it be detrimental to their overall i'll say performance but it's not the right word to that to their progression in their journey because they're seeing that you know uh perfection and hit hit left right and center yeah it's it's it is a double-edged sword because on one hand it's what social media brings is you know extremely positive because 
when I was younger in my early days, I didn't know anyone else who was disabled. I was the only person who had a disability. Um, I wasn't seeing anyone else disabled doing great things, you know, challenging themselves, pushing themselves and, you know, progressing in life. And that's one thing that social media has brought to the forefront. I've been, I followed tons of great people doing awesome things. And if I was just, you know, if I was not just becoming disabled, don't want to say that word, but if my life suddenly changed or I've suddenly got to come to terms with the change in my, you know, physiology, I could get easy doses of motivation through Instagram, through Facebook, because there are some amazing people doing some awesome stuff. And awareness of disability now is much higher than it used to be. But equally, like you say, you know, some of these social media platforms like Instagram, especially, everything is, you know, the best. It's the highlights. It's the, you know, the wins, the wins, the wins. And it can be a case where you start to compare yourself and you see someone else seeing, you know, doing miles better and you're kind of like, well, I'm not doing enough. You know, I'm, I'm not quite there yet. I'm not good enough. And I've experienced these feelings too. And it can be, it can be negative, but it just depends on how you perceive things. If you let that stuff kind of trouble you and if you kind of allow yourself to, to constantly be exposed to these images or these these feeds or profiles there is something you can do about it you can you know just unfollow them or not kind of see it in a negative way but there are definitely pluses and and you know drawbacks to social media i think it's just down to the individual and their perception if their focus is on the negative and like oh they're so perfect i'm not they've got it so good I haven't or things are so hard for me then it, it will be that that's what they'll get back but if you look at it where okay that person's doing really good things how can I replicate that or how can I use their successes to push me then that's a completely different thing so let's rewind back then from a social media perspective for you personally then mm -hmm. and let's take you down memory lane a little bit Talk me through the idea of you doing calisthenics around London. What what was the <laughs> idea behind that? Uh, um, so yeah, I discovered calisthenics in 2013. So this was just around my kind of Germany stint. And I um, met a group of guys at um, Primrose Hill, um, a group called Bar Sparta, and they kind of welcomed me in. Again, you know, there wasn't any like disabled people doing anything like that at the time so they're like yeah come in so you know hung around with them for a bit learned some cool stuff you know learned to learn you know how to control my own body weight and in the early kind of years of me training um connected with somebody who's like yeah let's grow your instagram profile let's just go to london and just do crazy stuff and just get people's heads turning and back then my my handle was the one-legged ninja then so everything was kind of you know this guy's doing not dangerous stuff but just like kind of head turning eye opening stuff you know doing flags off of like traffic lights and doing you know handstands in in you know awesome places and it was literally just to build the profile and just get people to follow essentially so and it's still a pillar of you know it's a kind of angle i take with a lot of my clients where they don't have to do the crazy calisthenics but you should be able to control your body weight doing the fundamental things like squats, like press ups, pull ups a little bit harder, obviously, but you know, the kind of fundamental core movements, you, you should be able to be able to control your own body weight through gravity before you start trying to you know, lift crazy amounts of weight in the gym or doing all these other like flashy things, just, just do the basics. And it's kind of a, a, a mindset I've carried on into training my clients as well. You know, I want all of my my woman clients or my or my women to do push ups. You know, strict form, be able to do at least five pull ups. Again, it's a slightly harder thing to train for, but I'll you know if they want to do it, I'll be happy to train them to do that as well. And yeah, calisthenics is always a. I always fall back to it if all else fails. You know, you can always smash out a set of push ups, sit ups, pull ups, squats, and that there is like a full body workout with no equipment. And I think in lockdown as well, people have had to revert to bodyweight training and basic styles of training because the gym hasn't been available anymore. Some people didn't have any weights at all, didn't envision 
a lockdown coming and equipment going up like 300% in price, <laughs> people have had to, you know, go resort to walking, running, push-ups, press-ups, sit-ups, all the basic things. And that's kind of, I've always got a love for calisthenics, like when all else fails, you know, it's still a fundamental part of my training and how I train other people. But I don't do so much of the kind of showboaty stuff anymore. Getting a bit too old for that stuff now. So <laughs> go look after the joints and all that. And then after the back of that, Tyler, did you do, um, oh, what's the program called? I almost said Ultimate Ninja. What's the British? Oh, Ninja Warrior. Called? Ninja yeah. Warrior. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. um, that was that came around around like 2017, 2018. Someone had mentioned, "Oh, you should go on Ninja Warrior again." Just the kind of Instagram handle, One Legged Ninja Ninja Warrior. Thought, oh, you should go on it. And I was kind of like, "Yeah, yeah, I, I might do," but then just didn't really do anything about it. And I think one day an email appeared from them, like the casting team. But it was like a broadcast email. It wasn't like to me specifically, but he's like, hey, we're looking for applicants for season five, Ninja Warrior. And I was like, you know what? It's in my inbox. Let's just give it a go. And then filled it in, got an email back to say, come and go come to this open day. Did that, got through. And before I knew it, I was in Manchester on a stage in a stadium with an audience. And I was like, shit, this is it. <laughs> like, this is how we got here. And it was, yeah, arguably one of the most nerve-wracking you know moments of my life but just gave it a go again one of these situations where it's an impossible task I wasn't going to get up the wall at the end because you know I've tried it impossible I, you know I hopped up twice like I was nowhere near the ledge so I knew I was going all the way up there to give it a go and not actually complete the course but it was like you know what I'm here I've made it this far I might as well just give it my best shot and I've got further than some people did with you know with both their I think that's what people really got excited about and re, you know really got behind me was the fact you know I got further than some non-disabled people still fell in halfway but you know it, it was one of the best things I did and hopefully I can go back and tackle it again once they start to um open up the the casting again so some unfinished business there. I want to go back and try it again. Do you, do you think for you to complete it, Tyler, you need it to fit your skill set? Because obviously the course changes depending on the heat. Yeah. Um, it's funny because all the upper body parts, like I would be okay with. It was just that one part that I fell in with like the, the wobbly balls and spinning balls. Like that's the only bit that, would have done me in and, and did do me in but again you never know that's the whole kind of ethos of ninja warriors you don't know what's ahead but you should be strong enough and prepared enough for whatever challenges come at you and it's a good kind of life lesson really and it's a kind of style of training that I generally do is just be prepared for whatever like be able to do whatever you want to do and you know, albeit we can't run like long distances, I mean, can't actually run, run, but you can use your crutches, you can do as best you can. But if I needed to do a 5K in my wheelchair, I can do that. If I have to do 20 press ups, I can do that. If I had to do pull ups, if I had to scale a rope, I could do that. And I just like being able to do whatever I need to be, whatever I need to do. It's not a case of, you know, having muscles and looking great with my top off. That's all a byproduct of just being healthier and, and being fitter but I don't want to have the biggest rig I don't want to you know I'm not performing at a high level anymore so it's all just about being able to do whatever I need to do and just conquer whatever task is in front and that was essentially Ninja Warrior I'd rock up there I don't know what I've got to tackle you find out on the day and when I saw the balls I was like ah shit you lot are killing me you lot are killing me how am I <laughs> is there any way you, any tips you guys can give me and they were like just just hop, hop across and hope for the best I was like okay and I tried that didn't work so yeah I want to go back again and give it another shot once my ankle's all better you bring up that that one in terms of because people that don't follow you on social media that's a freak accident you you breaking your ankle playing around with the kids not even though the kids weren't even there mate it was just me it was just me, like, it was just me. they had nothing to do they were inside watching I think Lion King or something I was out on the trampoline 
and again, it's a funny story, but I, I've always wanted to learn how to do the the back back tuck, like the back flip, or the front flip, either or. And prior to social media, you're like you know what, there's it's, it can't be done on one leg. This is impossible. It's not impossible. You come across a person that you know is a, a one legged um, break dancer who does it. There's another guy who's a rock climber. I'm like right. It can be done. It's just got to take some practice. But in my head, I'm like, if I land this wrong and I twist my ankle, I'm screwed because I then can't work. I can't do et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, you know, if I do land it and it's a bit of a mental block, it's something that I'm scared to do. If I do nail it, then I'm like, oh, that's nothing then. And I kind of thought to myself, if I got that nailed down, imagine what else I could achieve after getting over this mental block done a few reps got it that one rep that I landed wrong completely changed the game for that day or for the next you know foreseeable few months and it was tough initially but again finding the positives within the negatives it, the time it happened where we were all in lockdown anyway and we were all you know doing online trading I'm sure you know you've got your online remote client there was no real better time for it to happen and, you know, that was me trying to find the positives, see the silver lining in, in a albeit negative situation. I didn't have to train my clients face to face. Everyone was virtual anyway. I was still able to fulfill my services to my clients while staying at home. So, yeah, it was it was a tough few months and it's kind of 90 percent better now. But I've still got a little bit of restriction in movement. But all in all, I'm back to training and I'm, you know, healthy and able to move again. So I'm grateful for that. It was a bit of a learning curve, but I've learned a lot in that, in adversity. I've learned quite a lot of, or I've gained a lot of positives from it. So in a way, I'm almost glad it happened just because I've realised how, you know, I've improved my resilience. I've improved my mental toughness just from having to do various things as a result of, almost breaking the one good ankle I've got. Everyone's like, what's wrong with you, man? Why are you doing somersaults for? You've got one leg. You should be looking after it. I was like, ah, you know, it's what it is. I'll be back I, on there again at some point. I think we we like to test the boundaries and I probably, t- well, I'm, I'm lower down than you. So it's probably, well, mm. I would say it's a slight advantage, but I would probably be more accustomed to wearing my prosthetic. And you obviously yeah. showed that to your kids because it'd been up in the attic, which I thought was <laughs> it, it opens the world for them. They'd never seen you with with the leg on, yeah. but for me, I've obviously no hey, dog. Yeah, just want some love. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so um, with that, I've obviously twisted my ankle like loads of times. Never gone to the extreme that that you were unfortunately had to oh. to to succumb to. And obviously that was probably quite a lot of frustration being sat around. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, just kind of my identity since, you know, becoming a PT has been, you know, the the guy with one leg who doesn't have any limitations essentially. And then I then turned to that guy who had to like shuffle on his bum to get up and down the stairs. And like, I couldn't hop, you know, like hopping is just my natural way of getting around it's always been the way i've moved freely at, you know as i've got older the legs become more of a hindrance than a help just because of where it sits and like you know my i haven't got my residual limb or anything like that so when i couldn't you know hop just to like go to the toilet or hop downstairs like that's what really kind of messed with my head initially but after a while you kind of adjust you realize you know i'm grateful that i had a wheelchair to hand because if I didn't, I'd be in a much worse position. And yeah, the frustration was pretty real for the first, well, for like the first six months. But then when physio, got some physio done, started to gradually put pressure on it again and use my crutches. That was, you know, a bit of normality restored. But in all that, like I'm still quite an avid user of the chair to do my cardio now because I'll go out and do like five, six, seven Ks, the odd 10, where that's now my staple pot. It's my staple method of cardio to get in the chair and just push. Like I wasn't doing long distances before that. My cardio came from basketball, which we're missing like massively. That's probably something we're going to talk about in a bit. But 
I've learned other ways of keeping fit through using the wheelchair. And I wouldn't have done that if I hadn't injured the ankle. So that's kind of one of the pluses, one of the benefits that I've drawn from the experience. Hopefully, I'm not going to do it again, but, you know, you, you got to find the, the, the good within the bad. I'm not planning to do anything damaging to this ankle again. Well, it's always some free accidents, isn't it, at the end of the day? Yeah. So talk to me about, I, I'm, I'm assuming you are the only athlete in Maxi Muscle's team that is not everybody is that correct that is correct yes um they reached out to me in i think 2017 18 like in the height of my one-legged ninja antics <laughs> and um yeah they i had somebody who was kind of managing my socials who you know was really good at like making the brand's awareness and you know get in front of the right people and yeah they reached out and said oh you know I'd like to do some work and it was funny because Maxi Muscle were the first supplement company I heard of through the GB program. We had like a nutritionist back in 2009 and Maxi was the first company they recommended because of their rigorous batch testing. So everything that went through, like I'm sure with like you in the programs you were in, there's only certain products you can take because you, you know, so ours, mine was even more, and, mine was probably more stringent than that because they had a deal with one of the, with the obviously <laughs> I'll put it out there. There's more supplement companies than just the one the, uh, my, mine when I was in Rome was uh, science and sport. Yeah. And science was, and sport. Yeah. We had them too. Yeah. Uh, and they'd, and they'd obviously signed a deal with GB Rowing at that time. And then before that, it was Lucas. So mm -hmm. obviously you can see by me and Tyler talking about there's a lot of, uh, politics behind the scenes yeah yeah politics. yeah this all kind of stuff i had no idea of and i think because i didn't get to progress into the higher ranks like the top 16 i, I was kind of oblivious to all the stuff going on behind the scenes but in terms of you know the the supplement side of things you had to fuel yourself with you know the right foods to perform it wasn't all about supplements because you know we should really get what we need from a balanced diet and you know actual food supplements just top up our existing intake of nutrients but yeah maxi were the first one that i heard about and learned of and then when they kind of came around and said hey we'd like to do some work i was like yeah like i'm, I'm down let's let's do it let's do it so you could kind of promote the product with confidence knowing that there's no funny stuff in there there's been no product recalls because something slipped into a batch and it shouldn't be there. You know, athletes, they're, they're connected with, you know, elite sports. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. And even though I'm not doing elite sports myself anymore, I was just happy to be aligned with a company that, you know, has good values and good morals and generally a good reputation, especially in the UK being one of the oldest, oldest, one of the more established companies in the supplement game. So so yeah, and I'm yeah, I'm the only non-disabled ambassador on the roster. That's that's a pretty good uh thing to have to your name as well, in terms of it's probably a lot of hard work pre-lockdown because that's because you obviously had to go to expos and things like that and, and, and yeah, work on yeah. their behalf. I think again it's just exposing the fact that you know having a disability or a physical limitation it doesn't exclude you from being healthy and being fit and being active and you know performing to the best of your abilities and even performing at an elite level i mean paralympians work just as hard if not harder than you know the non-disabled counterpart so it's just getting into the public eye and showing them look like i'm here i'm i've got one leg but i'm still fit i'm healthy i can do things a lot of people with two legs can't do so yeah it's it's been a good journey and hopefully it will long continue but how do you portray that tyler without having a sub story that you know that um every television network likes to spin it's like <laughs> as you as a competitor will know you don't care what disability that person has especially especially i've i've seen seen when it comes to play of times with the the Premier League teams they don't they don't tell back 
Yeah, no, it's um, I mean, you know, pretty much in in especially like the wheelchair basketball circles, like we're all quite ruthless. We all like banter each other. There's there's team jokes. There's you know, we can't even call it like disabled jokes because it's just us. Like we are just yeah. who we are. This is our support group. This is our team. This is our network. And we would like rip the shit out of each other with no no holding back. But somebody who's on the outside or they might be non-disabled, they're like, oh, do you, you know, you guys can't say that. Like it makes them uncomfortable. But we've all got different stories. And whether you're born with your impairment or you've kind of gained it later on, you know, it it does shape your kind of outlook on things and it does shape your 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 mindset i mean i feel that uh, because i was born with the one i've not had to adjust or i've not had to kind of overcome any massive obstacles in terms of my kind of psychology and stuff but i do feel that people that are quite recent or quite new in their situation there's a massive kind of mindset shift there's a lot to get over psychologically and they might be quite low for a while but Again, social media, you know, the internet, you will see that there's plenty of opportunities and plenty of places you can kind of outlet your, frustra- not frustration, but your, even your concentration or focus that will put you in a better place. And I think since, I guess, since London, the awareness of disability and the, the ability of disabled people is much better now. So there's not so much a sob story or, you know, I'll pull you, oh, I'm so sorry. I mean, I do get the odd kind of elderly people who are kind of stuck in a certain mindset. who are like, oh, bless you. Oh. I'm like, I'm fine. Like, life's good. Like, I'm, I'm out here living my life. I'm, you know, I'm healthy. I've got my health, got my family, got a job. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm good. But you do get the odd person that kind of comes with the, oh, what happened? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, nah, like, it's, it's, everything's good. I've got a lot to be thankful for still. Life might be a whole lot worse if I had two legs. I might, you know, be in a much worse place. So just kind of seeing the benefits, seeing the pluses, seeing the, the goods, the good within the, it's not even bad. It's not even bad at all. And, and you raised about wheelchair basketball. What are we now? We nearly a year and a bit on since Competitive basketball. I I, I can yeah. pinpoint the exact place there was last time. I was. What was your last? I, game my, last game was Ste- my last game was state. My last game was Steelers. Um, and to give people some perspective of that, obviously you play against the the the, the Premier League side, so they've oh. got pretty much teams coming from every part of the country. They're playing Exeter at the time. So you're <laughs> yeah. thinking in terms of probably spread of COVID. You couldn't think of a worse, worse probably, t- but, but but nobody knew nobody knew the the it the gravity be. in terms of what we were we were heading into in terms of, I think overnight it went from, you were competing, to we have to wait and see, <laughs> to, we're terminating the season, yeah, and that was in the space of about probably like two weeks. Two weeks. It was, it was on. It was surreal really surreal because we had our last competitive game against Coventry who are you know they're a great unit and we lost to them by like one point so that was like a real sore loss and we were like right we've got to go back to training this week we've got to refocus regroup we've got Euro Cup like beginning stages in like a couple of weeks going out to Switzerland so you know let's get our heads on back to the drawing board and yeah like the next week it was like oh okay let's see if Euro Cup's going ahead and then literally by the next week, like everything was just shut down and you didn't real ha- you didn't have any like closure. There wasn't any one more session before everything went. It was literally just that. I mean, we were like, oh, okay, shit, this is actually real. And then we went to like doing Zoom calls every Thursday when we'd normally train. So we'd like sit and watch some match footage and, you know, just banter each other and stuff. But we were like, okay, cool. It's August now. The league's looking at coming back in January. We were like, yeah, it should all be back by then. December comes, nothing happening, still thick in COVID. And yeah, we spoke last week. And we were like, it's been a year since we actually kind of had a competitive match or training session. And it just took so much for granted. I think we all did pre-COVID, like this was just what life was. And then 
pandemic came and literally just took everything we we used to and that we took for granted just just whipped out from underneath us and I remember you used, used to con- complain about going to training after like a long day of training clients and I've got to go home quickly then go to training I'm really tack I'm like I'm just drained like I've got to do two hours I was saying to the lads like when we start up again I'm never complaining about training ever again I'm gonna be so excited to go and play because it's just a massive part of our lives that's again been gone luckily I've got other things going on but you know some people basketball was literally all they had this it was their support network their social group their peers like an extended family and then apart outside of basketball some people don't have much else going for them and it's been tough I've, I've missed it terribly I'm probably got the worst ball handling skills now I'm going back to square one again so yeah I'm looking forward to when restrictions ease and I think disability sport will still be placed in that kind of um, exemption bracket where they want us to get into sports early before all the rest of you know indoor sports happen so hopefully they've still got that kind of mindset when things open up again because I want to get back in my chair and start playing again. What's it been like for you personally then watching the likes of football and rugby? I don't, watch, I don't watch football anymore. I kind of fell off like football when I went to Germany. Rugby, I don't really play, but part of me was like, ah, oh, you know, it's not fair that they get to continue on, but they've got, you know, tons of money being pumped in. I mean, it's funny, in a, in a time where, you know, we've economic recessions and, people losing jobs left, right and centre. Like, there's still money to pay footballers crazy wages. And there was that kind of period where they were talking about their wages should be docked and stuff. And there's all these debates and footballers up in the air, like, no, why should we get our pay card? No, you're getting 250 grand a week, mate. Like, calm down. But yeah, there's different kinds of money involved in those sports. And, you know, I think sport is a big part of British culture and, I think, you know, with like the Premier League still being played in rugby, it's helping some people, you know, it makes life that little bit easier if they've still got their team to watch and support and be a part of that. It's not fair for the rest of us who, you know, don't have basketball or don't have anything else. But, you know, it's 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 good that there is still some, you know, we can still watch NBA and stuff like that. So the big sports with big money, they're, you know, they get, tested quite often and they've got their bubbles and stuff so you know it is what it is I can't really get annoyed at it because I, I can't control it it's got nothing to do with me so if I sit here and stress about what's out of my control that's just gonna make me old real quick so yeah <laughs> focus on what I can control and you're talking about obviously the the exemptions of disability and people being exited obviously we you and I both know that this this the mental well-being of individuals to do exercise, mm-hmm. uh, obviously moving about, improving movement is paramount. And and I like when people give me the the ammunition to put into the gun. Like I'm, I'm, I'm talking metaphorically, of <laughs> you're giving me all the the ammunition to come back at you with with, with your objection. I'm not going to say excuse because you're not moving enough your well-being is in the toilet Mm. well this is going to help you um but obviously i think when people are not immersed to what we're talking about you know in terms of it's a support network as a as well as a sport it's very very uplifting and i'm probably at the other end of the spectrum when it comes to to come finishing work going to training and I've for, for I'm a little bit a few tiers below it, obviously where you're at in terms of playing, but that was an escape for me. It's like, well, if I've had a bad day at work, go buy a yeah. forget yeah. about my worries, have a good day, it's even better. Have yeah, so. a have an in, indifferent day. You pretty much and we had one session in the summer outside when it was actually nice, <laughs> and the weather was starting to turn into the to to, to the autumn. And I and I kind of felt not, I won't say it's not like a, a you would you know what I'm talking about like a void in terms of no care in the world. Mm. I haven't felt like this for months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 
we had we had a session during there was like the one easing of restriction just before that kind of tier five came into play i think november ish december times and you know our club had gone to like great measures to have like four people per session and you know people in people out everyone's in their little stations and we had a a training session it wasn't anything like a normal session but you know you were indoors you could bounce the ball on a hard floor your chair just like rolled rather than being on like playground tarmac and it was literally like exactly the same thing like oh, i've not kind of felt this in a long time but then literally when that session finished we got the announcement that london was going into tier five and i was like we'd never heard of tier five before and suddenly it's like okay well we had to come to the realization that we're not doing this again next week and we're probably not going to do it again for the foreseeable future and that's what happened and again some of us have got other things going on we you know got things we can put our focus and attention on but for some of us you know basketball was pretty much our be all and end all and people's mental health has suffered a lot and I, again i hope that they can kind of push disability sport to the forefront and say look like you guys you're all pretty much vaccinated now go off and get yourselves you know back in shape and intermingle and you know play the sport you love not just basketball but like all kinds of well, i think it sport. i think it was difficult for governing bodies especially basketball because they're trying to balance free government protocols which must be an absolute nightmare in terms of what, yeah. what's this because um, for people that don't know well i think most of the clubs are in england there's there's about four or five in Wales and there's two in Scotland and there's one over in Northern... Oh, I forgot about Northern Ireland. Four, sorry. <laughs> um, apologies to the lot in Northern Ireland. <laughs> but that must be an absolute ball ache in terms of, well, you've got to take on board what Boris has to say, uh, what Nicola Sturgeon has to say. Um, I don't know what the person in charge of Northern Ireland is and obviously <laughs> Mark Drayford in wet. So it must be absolutely... I wouldn't want to be doing the, their protocol in, in terms of the the I'll call it copy because that's what it is. The the content what they put out was pretty amazing in terms of well, this is what the club is well players are allowed to do. You have mm. to pretty much I'm not gonna say sign a waiver, but you sign up to you're putting yourself at risk. Yeah, yeah. And we yeah, take yeah. we take number no, we take some responsibility for obviously insurers but you 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 as the player can oh, either opt in or opt out yeah yeah it's been it's been a, a very patient game but you know bwb have been doing the best they can to obviously get us to back to play as soon as they can given all of the different legislations and governments that they've got to work with so I mean, we've, we've been getting emails from them all the way through. And I think there's another one just come recently saying, you know, as soon as we know what the final say is, then we'll get the, get the documentation out. But I, yeah, I just hope there's some kind of, even if it's like a small tournament of sorts, like just, you know, something to look forward to. Well, worst, worst case scenario, they could always start the, the league as where it was. You've got, <laughs> yeah. you've got the you've got the you've got the records you've got the schedule in place and yeah. there was only was it, two, two or three months two three months of the season left to go anyway so if worst comes to shove you could follow the premier league model of not cramming it in all together but you could finish that season out mm. and then and um well, my team's concern was first team is not really important. They did guaranteed survival, so their season was pretty much not well, not null and void, but it was secure. Like it it was secure, and it was incidental. It was they might have won one more game, they might, and, and they might have lost a few more. Uh, the second team was on a roll, so it was very frustrating in terms of because mm -hmm. uh, they they put in a new playoff format of you know. Uh, it was fourth played first so it was a different different way as you'd go play yeah. you'd play somebody from a different region and, and just try and look at well this person is here you might put you might be because we were looking at maybe Essex or or Plymouth so it's a massive difference of who you're going to play and then 
just looking at people's this shows i think how analytical i am in terms of well who's likely to lose who's who's got games left and and what what's their their form versus other so you'd kind of see well where can this team slip up or mm. where where do we need to maybe overturn a result but i think that's probably where elite sports probably filtered down a little bit i don't think everybody other athletes like that in terms of looking at the no, there's a select few who are like analytical to that level. And when you guys connect, then it's literally just all stats <laughs> and figures and, and discussing the game. I, I have moments when I'm like that, but yeah, not often. We've got some teams that are like really ingrained and granular with the. Well, you can't control. You can't control yeah. a result of another just team. Estimate and hypothesize. Well, there's no guarantee with that either because. You only need somebody to have an off day, and what you thought was a guaranteed result doesn't happen. Like it's not good. It's not exactly. But I mean, kind of spinning it back to like like our clients and stuff with that controlling what you control, like you you know tell people don't worry about what you can't control. Focus on what you can control. Do what you what is fully within your you know ability to manage. Focus on that, and you know just do what you can and hopefully you get a, a positive result. But if you, you know, stress and worry about the external things that you can't, you have, you know, have no chance of controlling, then don't stress yourself and get all anxious about that. That's not going to help matters at all. So, and a lot, lot of things with COVID as well, like, you know, tons of stuff were out of, out of our control. I stopped listening to the news like last year. I hear the odds. Alexa update, you know, the news, the headlines every now and then, but yeah, stop watching the news, stop listening to the radio just because everything was just, you know, negative, negative stats, deaths, this, this, that. Like I can just put my energy and effort into something else more beneficial to me and like my here and now rather than just worrying about things that aren't in our control. So it's definitely been something I've been a lot more aware of and a lot more focused on just controlling what you can and letting go what you can't and my final question before we wrap up the episode Tyler is if you got down if you were if you got down if you were able to sit down with any athlete dead or alive who would that be and why (sighs) Um, that's a tough one See, my instinct says Michael Jordan, um, just because of the greats that he is, was, is. But then equally Kobe, but then also Allen Iverson, because he was like my kind of basketball hero growing up. I mean, out of the three, like, like we know Jordan's great. We know Kobe's great. Like Iverson's slightly different where he came from nothing essentially and he had like all the odds stacked against him and he was like small he came into the league and just made a massive impact and so it'll be good to kind of talk to him and find out what drove him and even though you know things were not always going his way and like the league were hating on him and he's always getting lots of stick on that you know what kind of pushed you and drove you to perform at that level and still leave a mark and like be held as one of the the greats of the game and like he just came in with this like I don't give a shit attitude he, you know he had the cane rows he had the tats he had like the baggy shorts you know like the big jewelry the kind of the hip-hop rap kind of aura about him and yeah he, like he really stood out to me as the kind of underdog and to me he's still alive so yeah it'd be good to talk, sit down and talk with him but yeah arguably you know MJ for what he did for the game and you know Kobe God rest his soul again left a massive impact and when he passed like it's crazy like it was it was like the whole world felt the loss uh, plenty of people passed away who were famous and you don't really care like sorry to sound cold but you don't really give a shit but when he passed it wasn't just basketball community that felt it like the whole world kind of like wow we've lost a good one there so I know you said one but probably I said three so <laughs> let, you, my... let, you, let you have the three 
And the last question I want to ask before we close the show is if you had to summarize what we've been speaking about into one sentence for people to take away, what would that be? Resilience. Resilience. Just, you know, having a bit more of a, a stronger mindset and not taking the easy route. Just almost seeking out challenge, essentially, and taking the path of most resistance. That's something I've taken from David Goggins recently is don't take the path of least resistance. You know, do diff do uncomfortable things because then when the easy things come, just they just flow off your back. Like it's, it's nothing. But if you keep looking for easy things, when something hard comes, it seems impossible. If you look for the uncomfortable, if you look for the difficult, when the easy tasks do come or when things are good, you're you're flying through life. So yeah, resilience. We spoke about a lot of things, but that's the one phrase that comes back. So yeah, man, that's it. So once again, Tyler, thanks again for coming on the Mindset Athlete Podcast. Mate, thank you. Thank you for inviting me on. It's been a slice talking to you, man. That's been my absolute pleasure. Thanks again for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed this episode and got loads from it. Anything that was included and discussed will be available in the show notes below. And I would love to hear from you. Come and connect and ask your questions. I've been James Roberts from jamesowenroberts.com. Remember this quote by Chris Hoth. An athlete is a mindset. It's how you prepare, think, and execute, not by some elite status or physical stature. Anybody can be an athlete. <laughs>